Hello, welcome to Beastly Theories. I'm your host, Andy McGrath. Now, today we have a very special guest, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Uh, he started his training expertise in the anat uh, anatomical sciences, got an emphasis in physical anthropology, joined Idaho State University faculty in 1993 after a stint at the Northwestern University Medical Center, teaches human, regional, and sectional anatomy in the health professions programs, as well as evolution and primate studies. His research revolves around vertebrate evolutionary morphology, especially primate locomotor adaptations. His formal study of primates began with doctoral research on terrestrial adaptations in African primates. It has since taken him from the dusty skeletal cabinets of far-flung museums to the remote badlands of Colombia and Argentina in search of fossil New World primates. He's published extensively on the evolutionary history of the South American primates and has described several new extinct species. He's documented varied primate locomotor specializations in laboratory and semi-natural settings. More recently, his attention has returned to the emergence of modern human bipedalism, evaluating fossil pedal remains and the footprints left in ancient strata. His co-edited volume from Biped to Strider, The Emergence of Modern Human Walking, Running and Resource Transport, proposes the more recent innovation of modern striding gait than previously assumed. His interest in the footprints attributed to an unrecognized North American ape, which we plan to talk about today, commonly known as Sasquatch, came into focus when he literally crossed paths on an enigmatic set of tracks in the mountains of southeastern Washington state. He's also erected the ichnotaxon diagnosing the footprints attributed to Sasquatch as Anthropoidipes Amero borealis, I believe. And he's conducted collaborative laboratory <laughs> research and field work throughout the Pacific Northwest and into Mountain West, as well as in Canada, China, and Russia. Now, Everybody who uh, knows you, Jeff, probably has seen you on television many, many times in many documentaries. So I won't go through all of that. But uh, suffice to say, you know, you are an accomplished person in your own field uh, and in this field again. So we hinted at your, your start in this particular field of research. Um, but tell us, yeah, how does a professor of anatomy and anthropology become a, a Bigfoot researcher? Right. Uh, a lot of naivete, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, and, right. and there's some truth to that. I, I was a bit naive and perhaps a bit idealistic about what, uh, you know, what constituted uh, good science. And I mean, I, I for me, this was uh, examining these footprints, uh, feeling the hair stand on the back of my neck as I realized, you know, a Sasquatch may well have walked by here last night. It was it was uh, an astounding realization, which. Uh, from which I, I didn't think I could turn away, regardless of any um, prior knowledge of, of the, the pitfalls that might uh, lie in my path, having uh, you know been familiar with my predecessor, Dr. Krantz, and and the uh, you know the trials and travails that he experienced at the hands of his colleagues in the scientific mm -hmm. establishment, as he liked to call it. Um, so that's I mean that's. Uh, that's kind of how I, I looked at these prints and thought, well, man, here, I mean, it was an exceptional opportunity. I mean, this, it's not uh, common to encounter that number of footprints in a, in a trackway, in a successive trackway in series. And to have that, that extraordinary luxury to be able to observe the dynamics and the animation of that footprint trackway as it um, you know as, as the foot interacted with a variety of substrates and conditions and and uh, um, maneuvering obviously looking I think looking over its shoulder at one point running uh, step length uh, increasing uh, rising up to the front half of the foot in some tracks the toes extended and some tightly flexed and gripping the wow. you know I mean the variety was it was just extraordinary and, and I and, and I uh, remember sitting there thinking, how could I walk away from such an extraordinary body of data, um, regardless of the, the stigma that's attached? And, and I felt I could bring to it. I mean, you know, you, <laughs> when you read that um, unabridged introduction, yes. uh, it mentioned my area of expertise is bipedalism and mm -hmm. the analysis of fossil hominin footprints. And so the extraordinary coincidence and in, in some respects of, of my expertise and background being brought to bear on you know, this very central body of data 
uh, and particularly with an extraordinary example that these this track line presented, it's like I, I, I just thought, you know, this this lends itself to what I can offer as, a, uh-huh. as an expert uh, researcher. So anyway, that was gee whiz, twenty three years ago. Wow, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and now. Um, you know there are hundreds of footprints, uh, footprint casts, and photographs, and so forth. Um, you know the uh, the analysis of the footprints has been extensive and, and ongoing. Um, Dr. Krantz had reached a point where he was advising investigators and enthusiasts not to even bother making footprint casts any longer. He said, "Look at all the casts I've collected, and where has it gotten me?" Exactly. And well, I, I kept I saying, "No, no, no! Don't uh, don't say that I, because there's there's always something." new to be revealed in each and every uh-huh. piece of data even if it's repetition of of some point of anatomy or uh of dynamic and so i've always encouraged people to document footprints carefully we can still learn things from them and we've learned a lot i mean i i think the uh, the model of the distinctive sasquatch foot and its mode of bipedalism which isn't exactly like ours but is is distinct in ways that are remarkably rational and consistent with the the, the body form and uh, habitat type that it has evolved in. Um, that's what's so extraordinary to me, I think. I mean, it's really amazing that you talk about your fortuitous stumbling into this field. That's largely unscientific. You know, for the most part, uh, there we are um, joyful amateurs you know, pursuing this um, this elusive, perhaps non-existing creature in the minds of some people across the globe. So, I, for me, I think it's 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 very important uh, that there are at least some professionals, and especially one with your background, which is why I read the larger introduction, and I thought that was very important actually mm-hmm. for people to think that that is your experience. Mm-hmm. You do have the higher ground, so to speak, in judging what you saw that, that first time. Right. Um, now, I would imagine, I'm sure other people would imagine that there is an academic price, as you said, grants pay, paid uh, for such dedication. Have you experienced uh, any negative effects from your public pursuit of this creature in academic circles? Oh, yes, I have. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, again, I, I was naive enough to jump into the deep end of the swimming pool, so to speak. Uh, before I had tenure, and uh, you know, your listeners may not quite understand the way promotion and tenure works, but uh-huh. um, it uh, it was uh, it was a, a knockdown, bloody battle to get uh, to uh-huh. get that uh, that step in rank and and that uh, sort of um, not job security, but in a sense, it is. I mean, it gives you a, a sense of continuity that instead of an, a, a year-to-year contract that allows for a certain amount of intellectual freedom, a bit of, a bit of leeway that uh, gives you the opportunity to explore what may be controversial or risky topics, you know, still uh, obliged to do that objectively and rationally and sensibly, which I have always striven to, to, uh, to maintain that, uh, that level, that high ground, as you say. Uh-huh. Um, but it, uh, you know, you would, <laughs> I had an experience not too long ago um, where I spoke uh, in a university setting and an invited presentation. And over dinner afterward, um, we, were, we were discussing some of the types of evidence and so forth. And, uh, and uh, there was a comment made. I was trying to very quickly re- recreate that entire scene in my mind here, but because it, it was very pertinent to what you had said. But uh-huh. Uh, but this gentleman, he basically said, you know, I, well, what kind of evidence do you have? I mean, you know, and, and I was talking about the footprints. I mean, the footprints constituted one of the, uh, the, the most compelling bodies of data. And he said, well, he was an archaeologist. Well, I'm not an expert in footprints, he said. And my response was, well, I, <laughs> maybe you should offer a little deference to my es- expertise, just as I would to your area of expertise. <laughs> You know, instead of just offhandedly dismissing this because you don't think it could exist and therefore the footprints must be hoaxed, you know, is that kind of I guess that's, that's an uh, interesting rebuff, actually. Well, yeah. I don't know anything about that. So you can't admit that kind of evidence to right. me. Right. I won't consider it. 
<laughs> you know, it, I, for many people, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, it's, it's purely a North American phenomenon, actually. And I, I have some of your pamphlets here, which you kindly gifted to me when we met. Uh, so there are, in fact, it seems many other similar sightings around the world. Or other countries might hide these creatures, and, and what are some of their names? Right. It's it's interesting, you know. And I'm often asked, you know, what's the relationship with the Yeti to the Sasquatch and so forth? And and I don't think they're all the same, and they aren't they aren't uniformly um, uh, distributed across the globe. Um, you know, if, if every culture had uh, both uh, folklore and contemporaneous accounts anecdotes uh-huh. of such creatures then then there might be some some basis for for considering this as some kind of a manifestation of a Jungian projection of of, uh-huh. of the wild uh, archetype you know of, of our oh, I see, yes. connection to the wilderness but i don't think so because there's a remarkable correlation not only with habitat with the types of habitat but even now as as sightings accumulate uh, in in a world where wild places are shrinking and becoming quite fragmented um, they still emerge from those deepest darkest wildest areas where you might expect a, a species like these to persist there uh, you, you asked to mention some of them so the sasquatch uh, throughout north america also has its analog its vicar if you will in the asia and uh-huh. uh, in the form of the Chinese Yaren, and each culture has its own name, but they're basically wild men. The Yaren means literally uh-huh. wild. Um, and, you know, and Sasquatch is the wild man of the woods. And, and the distribution is quite remarkable. And a little anecdote, and some of your listeners may have heard this already, but one uh, on one trip I had picked up a magazine and was looking at it, and I uh, one of the articles was about the imperiled status of uh, Asian tigers. And the graphic le- leapt out of the off the page at me because it had a map of Asia with one color indicating the historical distribution of Asian tigers, and it extended down, you know, from Siberia down through uh-huh. East Asia, uh, across India, and wraps up around the Himalayas and uh, um, Western Mongolia, it reaches the Western um, mountain ranges on the Western front of Mongolia, and. Then a second color indicated the now very reduced and fragmented remnants of that once most more extensive range. And what struck me was I had been collecting examples of Sasquatch-like footprints, very distinctive in their size, breadth, flat-footedness, mid-tarsal flexibility, and so forth, and across different areas of Asia. And as I looked at these highlighted uh, refugia where the tigers still persist, those were exactly the places that these examples came from. Wow. Uh, footprints. Now, you know, not that there's any, obviously, I don't want anyone to think that there's a direct relationship between tigers and, no. and uh, Sasquatch. And they, they, they may support. need a similar habitat. Exactly. Precisely. Yeah. So then you've got that creature, that species that, uh, you know, who knows what it is, whether it's a, oh. uh, a form of Gigantopithecus, whether it's a, um, a, a giant relic hominin like Paranthropus, you know, become giant. Um, there seems to be in also in that uh, in that region to the west of Mongolia, the Tian Shan, the Altai Mountains, the Caucasus, um, reports of very much more human-like, still hair covered, but uh, a higher level of intelligence, maybe some tool use, maybe some um, primitive language and so forth that suggests maybe the, the, this is the region of Neanderthals, former distribution, and or Denisovans. So there, the uh, Russian Almas has long been thought to possibly be represent relic populations of Neanderthal that didn't go extinct 20,000 years ago, but have persisted in small bands. Uh, although some, even uh, I think Dr. Porzhnev at one point, who was one of the lead investigators in that area in Russia, had speculated that perhaps they had finally gone extinct, that the uh-huh. stories were and anecdotes were few and far between and mostly just folklore, remnants of folklore about uh, their existence. Recent headlines uh, drew attention to the Hobbit of uh, Flores in Indonesia, the island uh-huh. of Flores. And so there we have uh, a very um, uh, vivid example of, of 
traditions of little people that are scattered all throughout Southeastern Asia and go by various names, Ibu Gogo and Dutu, or more commonly known as Orang Pendek uh -huh. and Short Man. And, uh, but all remarkably similar in their descriptions and, and behaviors. And then we mentioned the, the Himalayan Yeti, which yes. if, uh, if the footprints that I've, uh, that I've investigated are hard to be believed, seems to have a divergent hallux or big toe, much like other apes today, and may represent just a, a, a closer cousin to a, an orangutan or a, a gorilla ancestor that has has been sequestered in... Uh, um, would this be something that, uh, similarly to the Shipton photograph, that's very famous that we see, that's what we're talking about, simple. the diversion toe. Exactly. But the toes are so odd on the Shipton. I, if, I've always uh -huh. been struck. Um, it it has some similarities to a pathology, a pathological condition in humans known as macrodactyly. And, uh -huh. and, it's, and, and it's almost too coincidental, I mean, uh, for to, to just simply... or it's too similar to simply dismiss as coincidental, I think is what I meant to say. The uh, divergent or splayed out big toe and the second toe greatly enlarged in the human foot. But you rarely see it in adults because it's usually corrected surgically in, in the infant when it's still uh, manifest. Oh, but the, the uh, footprint that really should have replaced the Shipton as the icon of the Yeti footprint were the tracks that were found in the McNeely Cronin expedition to the Aran Valley in eastern uh, eastern Nepal. And they look yeah. essentially like a stout um, chimpanzee footprint with a divergent big toe and, and, and uh, modestly long uh, lateral toes. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, they were much more extensively documented, witnessed by, by more individuals. Uh, a footprint cast was made and photographed, unfortunately, didn't make it out of the country, didn't uh, cross uh -huh. But uh, it's never it never had the splash, of course, of, of the, as that iconic image on the front page of, of the Times, you know. And uh, uh, but if 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 accurate, it like I said, it clearly looks like a hominoid, like a, a great ape of some kind. And it's fascinating. So there we have four possible, at least main uh, broad categories. Uh, and back in 1960, after exhaustive examination of all sorts of, of evidence, footprint, anecdotal, eyewitness sightings, and so on, um, Ivan Sanderson, who wrote you know, the encyclopedic book about subhuman wild men around the globe back then, likewise uh, came to the conclusion that there were at least four types around wow. the world. You know? Now, when I was first starting I kind of shied away from that. It's one thing, it's, it's bad enough to suggest that there is one unknown, but to <laughs> multiply that by four. But now, given the, the shift in attitudes and paradigms in anthropology, it actually makes more sense that there would be more instead of just one. Because okay, the, you, you've talked about this at the conference, uh, the International yeah. Cryptozoology Conference. Uh, tell us, uh, I'm sure you're going to anyway, but tell us a bit more about that, about this right. new study about origins and how it may lead to those different types? Well, <clears throat> there was a time when anthropologists uh, had advocated a, an, a, a, uh, an idea of human evolution, which became known as a single species hypothesis. Uh, anthropology was growing and becoming more interdisciplinary, was borrowing principles from other disciplines. At that time, ecology had uh, one of its central fixtures was the niche concept and they had borrowed from microbiologists um, a notion called competitive exclusion the idea that no two species can live in the same niche at the same time uh -huh. and so anthropologists looked at that and thought well the hominin niche especially culture as, as a defining characteristic is a pretty distinctive niche and so there could be only one species so human uh, evolution was seen as this, as this uh, linear single file march of progression, uh, or at least succession, you don't want to use the word progression, towards Homo sapiens. Well, that uh, uh, started, uh, the, the foundation began to crumble on that notion a little bit with, with a greater understanding of the Australopithecines, the loose type uh, hominins 
because there were robust and gracile forms that wouldn't fit in a single species. And yet they were contemporaneous across the landscape. Well, it was thought, well, they're just bipedal chimps, basically, slightly bigger brain. Uh -huh. For all intents and purposes, bipedal chimps. So, yeah, we could tolerate multiple species of these. This would be sort of that early bushiness. But then from that would emerge Homo, the genus Homo. Well, no sooner had that caveat been erected than Richard Leakey described in East Africa Homo erectus or Homo ergaster, as it came to be known, uh -huh. Homo heidelbergensis or Homo um, rudolfensis and Homo habilis and robust Australopithecines of Paranthropus poisei. Uh, so there were at least four species uh, living across the Eastern African landscape two million years ago. And so the can just got kicked down the road, though. Well, OK, but by the time you get to, you know, home, later Homo, <laughs> then, you know, we're the only species that has emerged. But what we keep learning with every discovery is that the bushes or that the tree is bushier and bushier uh -huh. and bushier with multiple parallel. So that, you know, now there are places where you could go back in time uh, 20,000 years, 30,000 years in East Asia and, and potentially bump into five or six different species of hominin across the landscape. And, and the evidence keeps showing that these have persisted until more recently. So we do, we know that the discovery of the hobbit should have driven this home. Initially, it was estimated to be between 13 and 18,000 years old. That's been pushed back a little bit, but only by a few tens of thousands of years. We have Homo erectus potentially as young as 25, at least as young as 75,000 years. Wow. We, Homo heidelbergensis, our, our, our immediate ancestor, in uh, living alongside Homo sapiens in East Asia up until about 20,000 years ago. And Neanderthals, 10 to 20,000 years ago. Denisovans, we're not quite sure, maybe 20 to 30,000 years. But the point is that many of these branches have persisted much more recently in the fossil record. And I emphasize that because obviously the fossil record doesn't record. I mean, chances of it recording the last individual of that species is pretty, uh, you know, pretty outrageous to... It's, yeah. But it's a strange concept that we all have, in fact, that you look at like when you're describing the different branches, of course, I always think of the famous um, poster, you know, right. from yes. Chimps Right Up to Men. Exactly. So um, it's, it's strange to think that the, the fossil record shows a timeline, like a, a continuous timeline. Right. But that's the way we think of it. We think of it as being complete as well, don't we, this, this record, instead of just what we've found so far. So far, yeah. So, which is very interesting to me. I was really intrigued, actually, by the um, by the whole lecture, but especially that bit too. Um, coming to that, so I suppose you would be saying, in, in the case of Sasquatch, that that could be some form of uh, ape, some form of Gigantopithecus, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to things like the Almas and some other types, they may be some ancient form of man, Neanderthals. Right. right. Exactly. Yes. So Much it's really not that related. To one another, uh, well, not as directly related to one another as, as, as I thought they might be. If I, if I'm oh, thinking I... of uh, a Sasquatch around the world being some form of bear type, so you know, polar right. bears, black bears, moon bears—they're all right. essentially right. just bears. Yes, that's not really what you're saying here in, in oh, relation no, to these. Yeah. Like, Probably um, distantly related to one another. It's yeah. just been—it's that upright posture yeah. that that causes the uh, sense of, of, uh, of uh, commonality or familiarity. And we lump all these together as, as wild men, you know, hair covered, upright uh, hominoids, some kind. That's why I've kept the term, you know, relic hominoid. Uh, when Porzhnev first pr uh, proposed that, he meant hominoid in the more um, colloquial sense of man-like just relic man-like creatures, not in a strict taxonomic sense. But I think the taxonomic sense is very applicable. Members of the superfamily hominoidea are called hominoids. And uh -huh. that includes us and the great and lesser apes. You know, more pertinent, the greater apes, like, uh, you know, the close relatives of uh, gorillas, chimps, and orangs. But also all of the uh, hominin ancestors, those that have that share that lineage since the divergence with the common ancestors shared with chimps. Those are also 
under that broad umbrella of hominoid. And so uh -huh. since we don't really know, um, I've always been, and we, we, we had considerable discussions as we were trying to come to, uh, to terms of a name for this organization, not, well, not the organization so much as the title of, of a journal that I edit, the Relic Hominoid Inquiry, um, because uh, there, were, there were some advocates of a, of a novel term. They wanted to use a, a totally new set of terminology to set this study of hominology uh -huh. from anthropology. And I'm, you know, I'm a little reluctant. I don't want to distinguish it too much because as far as I'm concerned, it's part and parcel of what we're all about as anthropologists. And so I'd rather have it mainstreamed rather than make it more fringe by, uh -huh. the, you know, by the creation of a, of a distinctive terminology. So I guess you'd spend half your time explaining it. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> and we've already do that with hominid versus hominid. Yeah now yeah exactly. you know, most um, have yeah. no idea why in other words why or why you would ever change that and so to add another term <laughs> would just make it more problematic I mean, but, and of course to, to uninitiated it it is a confusing principle sure. where uh, i suppose laymen think in the terms of descendants of apes descendants of man in the the closer Right. Uh, forms of, of what we're looking at so and that was always a, a factor for me as well actually now anecdotal reports about these creatures around the world as well do they and you may have already answered my question do they share similar behavioral habits as the north american sasquatch in the way that they're they're witnessed and, and reported to behave well uh, to a degree there there are, are more distinctions say like between the russian almas and the sasquatch most most of what you hear and read about Sasquatch can readily be, I mean, with the exception of their their adaptations for bipedal posture and, and walking on two legs, uh, in, in the most superficial sense, being similar to us in that respect. But every other aspect of their behavior and anatomy can pretty much be accommodated in uh, amongst uh, the known great apes or, as I said, very early hominins like australopithecines when you come to the almas though it's a little different their foot uh is very different than uh, that of the sasquatch it's much more similar to ours in that it appears yeah. to have a, a well-developed longitudinal arch the footprints um attest to a foot that's very broad uh very splayed toes i mean clearly um uh, reflecting a robust skeleton of an individual that has never worn shoes. Uh -huh. um, but they also have some other, I mean, they're not nearly the, the giant size. They don't have the extreme robusticity of uh, the body form. Um, they, uh, they sometimes are described with differentiated head hair that's longer oh. than body hair. Um, sometimes even wearing, wearing crude clothing or skins, uh, hefting clubs or, or you know, spears, uh, uh -huh. shafts. Um, some of the local and uh, cultural anecdotes suggest that in the past, villagers have even traded with them. Uh, wow. There are um, uh, and, and attempted to communicate. They they they're they're very uh, crude at language, but they attempt especially to mimic the local um, vernacular. And so, the things that would be much more suggestive of a of a more man-like, more intelligent, one that, that's even capable of tool use. When Myra Shackley, a, a British uh, archeologist and anthropologist was doing her dissertation work in uh, Mongolia, she, and she drew uh, or brought a lot of attention to some of the writings of investigators there, like Greg Rinken, for example, whose works, uh, um, she, many of which she made available to the ang Anglophones through her publications. Um, and just recently, we, we had the good fortune of having more of those published in the Relic Commode Inquiry. But my point was uh, one of the one of the interesting uh, observations she made when prospecting for archaeological sites, presumably of Neanderthal, they would find these surface uh, finds, surface uh, uh, features, um, uh, stone tools that were essentially <laughs> Mousterian points that are typical of the Neanderthal tool culture or toolkit stone culture 
And uh, when she would show these to the local inhabitants, they would say, oh, yeah, the Almas make those. Why, why, why are those interesting to you? Who are the Almas? <laughs> oh, they're just these backward people or kind of hillbillies that live up in the mountains. Sure. We interact with them once in a while, but, but pretty much they keep to themselves. And now, you know, you can, it's very possible, and you could argue, you could, uh, to be devil's advocate, that, um, you know, local people would find archaeological artifacts that had eroded out or washed out and pick these up and 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 some sort of story would develop around and as an explanation for these crude stone tools that they find but when you ha already have uh interwoven in you know in the tapestry of their cultural uh -huh. view of the landscape these wild people with remarkably consistent consistent descriptions that span you know, uh, large geographical areas with remarkable consistency. It's kind of hard to just, you know, again, it really is. Something. It really is. And, you know, I think sometimes with ethno known uh, creatures, animals, peoples, uh, whatever they may be, we often belittle the locals in their knowledge yes. instead of just accepting that perhaps right. they have seen these people or these things and, and they're just, they're normalized in their environment, which is why there's no. A special for all about about right. their presence, and um, you find that with stories with Kili and Bembe or, or certain lake monsters and other things in, in lesser known parts of the world where it's just a normal animal, a right. normal creature that they inhabit that they encounter. Uh, that to me makes sense, but of course, I, I think it can be explained away, like, like you say. Now, right. in terms of evidence, obviously, footprint casts are, are very, very good. A lot of people, um, uh, well, I would wonder, first, if you could name several particular casts uh, around the world that you would find it hard to refute right. as anything but evidence of these creatures. Right. And secondly, what would you say to those who say that footprints are not evidence? Right. Well, uh, yeah, to start with the latter there, they certainly are. And you, if you look at, at the, any studies of, of mammals in any part of the world, uh, mammals, many of which are nocturnal, are, are very secretive and very, you know, furtive. We have this notion that you, you know, you know, like driving through Yellowstone National Park, where they're just, or, or East Africa, and there's animals everywhere to be seen. Well, that's just not the case when you're out in the montane forests of the Pacific Northwest. I mean, you know, if you're a good observer and you're and you're uh, attentive, you'll see uh, animals, but much more frequently you'll see their signs. And those people who are educated and informed about uh, tracks and traces, um, that has always been an important element in the study of mammal behavior. So that's, it's very good data. And, um, you know, and, and a lot, we, we've advanced a lot. I, I must admit, in, as an anthropologist, when the um, Laetoli trackway of East Africa were found, the, um, the footprints of presumably of an Australopithecus uh, probably afarensis, almost certainly afarensis, you know, dating to three and a half million years ago. It did, pardon the pun, kind of catch anthropologists flat-footed. They didn't have a lot of comparative data with which to analyze these footprints preserved in the volcanic ash. And so there was a rush to get out and study indigenous populations of unshod pedestrians uh -huh. to see what what human footprints might look like uh, made by people who had never worn shoes. There were lots of studies of footprints of non-human great apes, for example, um, and, uh, and myself included, involved in a little bit of that, sort of on the tail end of it, but, and continue it, pushing it forward. But anyway, so um, <clears throat> we know a lot more now than we did back in, say, the 60s or early 70s uh -huh. about uh, hominin footprints and and human footprints from an, from an anthropological perspective rather than a clinical um, point of view. Um, there, are, there are amazing examples. I mean, I have over 300 footprint casts in my, in my lab of, Goodness. of various quality, obviously, and, and not all are, are as uh, perfect as some examples are, but in some cases, the conditions were remarkable and, and thankfully, there were some people involved who were who were good at uh, preserving and documenting those uh, examples with casts and/or photographs. Um, I mentioned the footprints of the 
of the uh, Yeti at the McNeely Cronin expedition, which uh -huh. I stand as, as really the iconic now image of, of, of what the Yeti probably is. There are numerous examples of Alma's tracks and uh, Mary Jean Kaufman was a Russian investigator, um, still with us, uh, but uh, not in the field any longer. And again, we've had the good fortune of having uh, uh, a lot of her work translated into English and they can also, those uh, reprints can also now be found in the Relic Homoid Inquiry. But she has documented a number of examples of the almost footprints and, you know, for all intents and purposes, they look like Neanderthal footprints. Um, wow. And then there's the uh, Oreg Pendek. Uh, and there, that that is a bit muddled uh, or muddied, I should say. Not muddled is wrong word, but muddied. Um, Traditionally, the footprints attributed to the Orang Pendek were essentially hominin in appearance with a non-divergent big, uh, big toe, non-divergent uh -huh. big toe, and a very tapered, narrow. <clears throat> yes. um, and on the surface, that description sounds remarkably like a bear. Uh, the narrow, tapered heel, the parabolic five toes sort of dis disposed across the end of the foot. Of course, a bear has not only the hind foot that fits that description, but four paws as well. Um, and the people who have described orang pendek footprints, uh, you know, are, were uh, informed and uh, should have been aware. Um, there have been other examples, some of which suggest a divergent big toe, a more ape-like footprint. And um, obviously these can't be the same thing. So there's a possibility that we're looking at footprints of two different types of creature, unknown creature, or one has been fabricated or altered or misidentified. Uh, I see. Uh, having come from some other uh, known. Jeff, are there, are there any bear in that area? In so Southeast area? Asia, yes. The sun bear is, uh -huh. uh, is present. Now, I don't know the distribution across all of the individual islands, if they're still uh -huh. persistent on Flores or not. I'd have to look at that again. Uh, yeah, but yes, there, are, there are definitely a bear. About the only place you don't have to worry about misidentification with bear is on the continent of Africa. Uh -huh. And uh, there are only bear found up in the, uh, in the <clears throat> mountains of Morocco. That's the only place, you know. So no conflation there. In fact, it's interesting. Uh, and at some point in the not too distant future, your readers will can refer to this chapter. But I was invited to write a chapter for an edited book on bears looking at the you know fact and fiction of bear lore and science from from all points of view and uh, and it was it, the, the history of it was quite interesting how it happened he uh, the editors approached me and asked me uh, they said that they had this book and gave me kind of a praises of the book and they even sent me a uh, a, a sort of annotated uh, uh, table of contents with a, a brief abstract for each of the chapters. Chapter number five was about Sasquatch. Uh. And uh, as I read the abstract, they had they actually had someone who um, was a guide, an outdoor guide, and familiar with the phenomenon and the reports. But uh, she had intended to write a, a paper talking about the the Sasquatch lookalikes basically bear as sasquatch lookalikes and um and how m the footprints could be probably explained away as bear tracks and i said in response you do know who i am right <laughs> <laughs> i said i'd be happy to write this chapter but it's going to be 180 degree opposite perspective <laughs> uh, you know she was unable to fulfill her commitment so they were and uh, they were uh, approaching me about it. So uh, well, lucky I, that that's yeah. very good for them. Well, right, I, I think so, and and it was it was a great opportunity for me. And so I did write the chapter, and it's uh, the book is in production, and they were very pleased with the approach I took. I mean, I used kind of her framework of as as uh, hinted at in the abstract, but um, uh, and and while acknowledging, I mean, you know, for using the Yeti for example. Uh -huh. There's a tremendous degree of conflation between bears and apes when it comes to the lore of the Yeti. 
And in fact, you know, some of the names actually translate as man bear, uh, you yeah. know, and I think uh, so that was an interesting example to show where there really was that potential. And, and that in fact, many of the quote Yeti tracks, the footprints attributed to Yeti are indeed bear. There's no escaping that. But when it comes to Sasquatch, when you have a 18 inch footprint that uh, is one of a long series of tracks down a beach or down a, a muddy road with no signs of quadrupedalism, um, you know, only the most superficial resemblance to a bear track and outsizing it and distinctive morphology that uh, is much more hominoid in character. Uh, you just cannot, again, offhandedly dismiss it, uh, all that evidence. If even one set of footprints, you know, is bears up under well, th this is it. Like, I think this is a very, very valid point, actually, w with many cryptid sightings, but especially this one. If you'd have to imagine a bear of, of gigantic proportions in order to fulfill those footprints, sure, if they were in fact uh, quadrupedal, that's a, an even bigger stretch sometimes. It's yeah, and there are a few bears that could that could probably fill the bill. I mean, when you look at the uh, bears on the coast of Alaska or the Kodiak Islands where they have a diet that is just extremely rich in protein and they've grown to considerable size. So a 16 inch hind paw of a Kodiak bear isn't out of the realm. Uh -huh. of oh, really? Yeah, but, but having said that, I mean, the resemblance is only superficial. Uh -huh. And uh, one of my field guides, you know, you mentioned some of the, some of the pamphlets, brochures, one of the field guides goes through and enumerates the distinctive field marks that uh -huh. distinguish a bear paw, uh, even a registered print that, that gives it a, an artificial elongation and the appearance, at least for short stretches of bipedalism. Um, there's still, are the, the, the telltale signs and distinctions are so uh, obvious to anyone that's informed. There's no mistaking the bear. Yeah, sure, and I'm guessing it's something that you couldn't really maintain over, as you say, over a decent length of trackway. No, no, only under unusual circumstances. One time I had a, a bear, an amateur bear biologist of sorts, excuse me, who came down, he had tracked a, a, a something that had gone up over a, a snowy pass uh -huh. through the tailless scree, jumbled rocks. And there, see, wherever the forepaw found a place amongst that jumble to, to, uh, to, to rest, then the hindpaw naturally fell into that same spot. And so for, for over like a mile and a half, he had tracked this thing up over this pass and it looked like, and you know, he showed me pictures from a vantage point to look down along the track line. It looked like a bipedal trackway with an uh, admittedly short step, uh -huh. but, but that could just be a cautious step. But once he took a picture close up in the snow, you could see the superimposition. You could see the extra toes. You know, you could yeah. see the claw marks in the snow quite clearly. But he was struck by that remarkably consistent, almost bipedal appearance. You know, to the extent that he came down and asked me what I thought about it. So in person. So it was an interesting uh, experience. That's great. That's great. And it's good. It's good, Jeff, to know there's somebody out there pointing out what is a bear, what isn't a bear. Because, <laughs> again, this genre needs some clarification. And on that, that point, actually, um, these days, a lot of people enjoy going out into the woods and looking for Bigfoot. And some of them are very serious, and, and some of them, like me, are it, it, they're, they're fans who've taken it a bit more seriously than they should have done. <laughs> um, what advice would you give them in regards to collecting and documenting evidence, casting footprints, and, and staying safe? Well, the, the field guide has, has served that purpose remarkably well, very, very successfully and very popularly. You know, the, the purpose of that, when I was approached to write that, write a field guide about Sasquatch, my my first reaction was, well, we don't really know anything about the behavior and, uh, uh, and, and anatomy other than through inference, through, you know, indirectly through this trace and, and uh, photographic evidence. But then it occurred to me, I was constantly being asked, well, how do you make a footprint cast? What should I look for uh -huh. and scat and et cetera? And so it became kind of a how-to. And, uh, you know, one of the most important I always encourage enthusiasts, and, and I hate to use the word amateur because I want people to 
uh, strive for that label uh, of citizen scientist. I want them to sure. be objective and critical. So often enthusiasts, uh, they, they read far too much. They overinterpret uh, the data uh, that they may come encounter, uh, uh, may encounter. Um, and uh, attribute far too much to Sasquatch. Um, you know, we haven't talked about things like how many are there, but just, just to, to make that this point very briefly, in the state of Idaho, I would estimate, which has more wilderness area than any other state in the lower 48, uh, I'd estimate there's only about, you know, 200 to 400 Sasquatch in the entire state. Without wow. all the details of that, by comparison to an estimate of 25,000 to 30,000 black bear. And so how, you know, you go out in the field on your weekend as, you know, as a weekend warrior uh -huh. enthusiast, how often do you bump into sign of black bear? Uh -huh. well, there's a hundred exactly. times more black bear than there are conceivably than there are of Sasquatch. So what are your odds? I, I one time trying not to be, you know, have put too fine a point on it with an individual who was going on and on about all the squatch activity they were encountering every weekend, you know. And I said, well, that's amazing. You're, you're, you're good fortune at encountering this rare and elusive animal. It's pretty amazing. You, know, you should take more pictures and whatnot. But I said, do this for me. Since you're so good at that, the next time, next weekend when you're out there, bring me back a picture of a buck, you know, a nice, with a nice rack. Uh -huh. And I said, that should be no problem at all. I mean, there's probably a thousand times as many deer as there are Sasquatch. So you'll bump into a buck for sure. And he kind of was quiet and finally sunk in, it sank in what I was getting at. Uh -huh. That is, you know, you're out there and you're wondering, why aren't I seeing a Sasquatch? Or if you're <laughs> realistic, well, then just ask yourself, why haven't I seen a fox? Why haven't I seen a marten? Uh, you know, why haven't I seen a deer yet or a yeah. bear? Those yeah. things are so much more so much more common out there that you know what almost all encounters uh, with sasquatch are absolutely serendipitous uh, that, and that's what i think yeah 90 was, was I, i'd imagine of all encounters i've i've looked at i was driving down the road late at night early in the morning i was walking my dog i was walking through the forest when suddenly the antagonistic incidental witness says i saw this thing right. not the bigfoot researcher not the squatcher right. not the um scientists dedicated to the hunt because i think looking looks like hunting but just yep. strolling along my dear own business you might catch it off guard right. and, and um, hard. there's just there's so many people i mean not long ago without going into details but uh, oh. there was uh, uh, on, on a, a little listserv that i uh, or a, a mailing list rather i guess that i'm that i'm on uh someone um there was reference to a, a video on youtube and i looked at this video and and it's an individual uh, walking around with his video camera. And I'm not kidding. Every, every little yeah. depression is a Sasquatch nest. Every, every uh, you know, op, uh, leaning tree or, or yeah. X figure is, is Sasquatch sign. And then someone else came on and looked at it and said, oh, you're missing a bunch of stuff. I see signs. <laughs> this is literally verbatim. I see signs of 15 family clans. In your video of Sasquatch. I think that's a buzzword for me that really, really gets my back up. Clan. Clans. Nope. I, well, you know, there's a lot going on. Sometimes I, I think we should be renamed Stick Hunters. Or... Well, I know. See, that's that's what I mean. It's because yeah. it is so difficult for the weekend enthusiast to find yeah. food. Then, then unfortunately, they've, they've been susceptible to this substitution with yeah. non-data, in, in my opinion, non-data. I mean, yeah. unless, unless you've got association, unless there's trace or physical evidence, footprints, hair snagged in this uh, uh -huh. structure, a scat pile right in the middle of it, you know, you have no basis really, none whatsoever. It's all inferential uh, that, that Sasquatch is involved with it. And it's just, you know, it really is mud, has muddied the water quite honestly. I think it really has, and it, it being, um, uh, not even being a citizen scientist in this realm, I just started writing about uh, different phenomena in the UK. And I found some reports and I started investigating out in the field a bit more. And it's been a step-by-step -step process. 
Right. I wanted to be very objective all the way through. And I listened to what people say on oh, signs of something or other. And, and personally, for me, anything that could have been made by a person, bushcrafting, for example, is very popular here. Yes. This uh -huh. strange, you know, rock piling on beaches and in woods to leave some sort of momentum forever and ever and ever. Right. That's very trendy at the moment. That's, that's a feature. Yeah. Uh, I was recently in Scotland looking for Nessie after there'd been a sighting. And there's a, a path that runs up into the Great Glen Highway, up into these huge pine forests, uh, up these very steep hills, I'd say. They're not exactly mountains. And there were trees across the path. It's, it's, it's January, you know, it's abandoned. There's nobody there at the moment. And I was up there for four hours. I didn't see or hear one single animal. And yet there were several trees blown across the path and some looked like they'd been pushed by the root ball. Now I knew there were high winds two days before. Right. But in the video I say, if a tree falls in the wood, Sasquatch push it over. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> right. Not necessarily. <laughs> Trees fall into X's and they bend and they break and they you know, sometimes kids come along and put make little pinwheels and do all kinds of silly things. Right. Um I don't think and I don't I don't deny that they they do leave markers for, for one another, but I would imagine they're primarily left in a way that would not attract our attention. Right. I think you're right there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's one of the things we have to get through as a genre. It's a popular genre, um, which actually, that brings me to the, the next question for you coming off, off this subject. So um, you've done a lot of television work. You know, There are pitfalls to try and to present Sent a scientific viewpoint in the soundbite generation that we live in. Do, do you feel you've ever done anything where you've been particularly misrepresented? Oh, there have been a few. Um, you don't have to name them. You can yes. name the situation if you like. No, there there have been a few. It's it's um, early on when these documentaries began to to gather some momentum. The, there was kind of a formulaic approach, and it often involved an interview with me, uh, in, in those that I was involved with, an interview with me, and then unbeknownst to me, they've interviewed, uh, say, a skeptic, an armchair skeptic. And then they're edited together in such a way as if we are, you know, point counterpoint, <laughs> as, that old show, uh, as if we're debating one another. Oh, but of course, you're the believer, and he's the rational. Right. Yeah, and, but actually, yeah. neither has any knowledge of the other's response. They're just edited together as if they're uh, re we're reacting off of each other. You never have an opportunity to defend, and and as is so often the case, you know, the armchair uh, amateur uh, or investigator, not amateur, the arm no, I'm back up. The armchair skeptic uh -huh. uh, is given an opportunity to to rebut something with some offhanded very dismissive generalized explanation that that you can't it's it's like it's like debating evolution and religion there aren't there aren't little soundbite answers that that uh, address the issues that are raised by the perception of conflict yeah. in that topic it takes a lot of understanding a lot of knowledge a lot of explanation and that's and these are essentially uh, to one another world views Right. Opposing world views. You and, and you're expected to give a, a soundbite answer, a snippet of, of a, you know, 10 or 15 seconds. I mean, I'll give an interview in my lab here that will last literally for hours. And we'll, and, and, and I'm thinking, wow, this is great. You know, I'm having a chance to really explain myself and to present examples here and cutting in B-roll and what all this. And then what? You know, literally two, three minutes appears if, or, okay. or one statement may appear. Um, and sometimes, you know, on rare occasions, they have been taken out of context. Sometimes, sometimes, um, well, one that was the most uh, egregious, I think, was the uh, the one about uh, the hikers in Russia that went uh, uh, in fell into, Pass? Is that yes, right? yes. Yeah. And see, I was that was a straightforward Sasquatch interview, but with the way it was portrayed in the documentary. Um, it was everything was focused on that one incident, which only came up in passing conversation when the cameras weren't rolling when I was being interviewed. And so it was. So you it, didn't even know that you were you were speaking about this. You were giving no, comment on that no, subject. Not at all. 
it, I only became aware when um, I received a, a, an email uh, giving me the heads up that they were launching their uh, PR campaign. They had a whole list of, uh, of possible interviews for me and all you know news morning news shows and things across the country <laughs> about this sensational story and the, the uh, name of the of the documentary and i go i called them back up and i said well what do you want <laughs> me to do you want me to tell them that you broadsided me blindsided <laughs> me that i had was interviewed with no knowledge of the even the 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 thrust that you were going to take with the story oh no no just tell them about your interview and i said but you gave them the same press release they're going to ask about this event, which has nothing to do with what I do, and and I don't think has anything to do with relic hominoids at all, quite honestly. I so can see the headline now. Jeff awkward. Meldrum says it was a squatch. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what's going to happen. Well, another one uh, that was kind of uh, it was a bit humorous, and and they did at least they did a, a responsible job, but they they dramatized. Um, it was supposed to be a what if. What would it be like if this team went out and actually captured a Sasquatch? And and they dramatized it, they portrayed it, but it was it was like the War of the Worlds all over. Uh, <laughs> People never caught on to the disclaimer that this was just a dramatization. And wow. so I got tons. And then my my interview was interleafed here at parts okay. when they kind of break away and talk to the experts. And nothing I said was was out of the ordinary or different than a typical kind of an interview. They were they were not direct comments directly linked to what was actually happening in the dramatization. Uh, and yet I got all kinds of email. Why did they let it escape? Why did they do this? Why? And I says, you do know it was fiction, right? It was just a dramatization. <laughs> and then, oh, then why would you be associated with such a production? I said, I have no creative control over how they exactly. how they do these but people things. don't realize that your involvement yeah. in something to some uh, people who are not familiar with it but your, your involvement clearly right. indicates that you were there during production yeah. the cuts and the edits and saying no keep that bit leave that bit out and um uh, jeff jeff's work is done here now you can you can you can uh broadcast that film it's ready to go right. instead of as they say six to eight hours in your studio for them looking for the perfect it was a squatch soundbite um exactly, exactly. it's interesting and you it's have definitely to an interesting that there is no such thing as off the record it no. all, you know that you can't have just a casual conversation anything you say can and will be used to their benefit to re and that's the thing too is it's not some of these documentaries are not just reporting they're not investigative journalism yeah. they are storytelling they, they have come up with a plot and a story that yeah. they want to tell in a script. And they don't want to diverge from that script. And I've been written out of, yeah. of a production when what my conclusions or my comments don't fit the predetermined script. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. So, I mean, what would you know, really, after 25 years, right? Yeah, uh, right. right yeah, you yeah. can contribute. Uh, now, when we, we first met um, at the International Cryptozoology conference last year. Um, we were all sitting down for dinner, and I bumped into you in the lift. And I told some of my friends a funny story. I saw you, and the first thing that went off in my head was, "Don't talk to Jeff about Todd Standing. He does not want to hear about this. You've just met him. Don't say a word about Todd Standing because it's a controversial subject. I'm sure you hear about it all the time." Yeah. And then that night we all went for dinner, and similarly to today, somebody said, "So tell me about Todd." And they went, "Todd Disital." <laughs> and you, I said, talk to Jeff about Todd Standing. He doesn't want to know. And you said, I'm fine. And we talked about it. It's fine. Sure. I don't want to talk about it now. Mm -hmm. But what I do want to know in regards to Todd Standing is his, in his documentary, Discovery Bigfoot, you uh, told you uh, exclaimed that, that you had had some sort of experience out there in the field mm -hmm. of seeing some kind of figure. So can you tell us more about that sighting? Sure. Any other experience? where you feel it may have been Bigfoot related while right. you've been on an investigation? Well, the circumstances leading up to that, ben, Dr. Bindernagel and I were, were Todd's guests, and we were there to, he wanted to sh introduce us to one of his study areas, the Nordegg site. And, uh, and, and honestly, he was quite taken with a, a number of, of tree structures. There were some interesting tree breaks, some very isolated breaks that that were of a nature and height and dimensions that 
that were intriguing, you know, and I, and I've always kind of held, you know, uh, a bit of a, a level of skepticism when it comes as we've earlier uh, alluded to tree structures, but he showed me one structure. Most structures, if you just stop and think for a minute, uh, you can, you can roll back the clock in reverse and, and well, this is the first one uh, or the last one that fell. Let's pull that off. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the pick up sticks game in a way you can tell, how it came about, even some odd things where it looks like a, 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 a tree has been shoved up into something uh, completely backwards. You can find where it has cantilevered uh -huh. because of a second tree and uh, falling on top of one that's leaning and cantilevering it up and breaking off an end, etc., etc. There was one large structure that that was quite intriguing and interesting and. And, you know, I, I couldn't necessarily, I wasn't convinced that it was not a natural feature, but we had seen some tracks in the moss uh, in the area over the course of the couple of days. They were about 13, 13 and a half inches long, bigger than any of our boots and, and um, you know, no features really to discern, discern them by other than the outline in that thick, thick moss on the forest floor. We festooned on one night, we festooned that that uh, structure with big apples. I mean, really big. I only emphasize that they were big because there were like eight of these gigantic red delicious apples, which, you know, I just can imagine a raccoon manipulating or a possum manipulating a single apple, let alone eight of them. And the next morning they were completely gone and without a wow. trace. And there were 13 inch foot prints in the moss that appeared to lead up to the structure and, and recede away into the forest. So that was intriguing, you know, and things like that. And then uh, on the last night, we, we always stayed up quite late and uh, around the fire uh, and listened and watched and so forth. And on this night, I had my um, night vision monocular and, um, and it was pretty good. It's a third generation ITT, it's quite good quality, but I didn't have it hooked up to a, I used to have a, a video camera that would attach oh. and I, so I could record. It has no recording features, which is always, you know, and it always happens when you don't have, <laughs> you're not prepared, it seems. And so I'm, I'm just observing for, for my own benefit. And about 1, one thirty in the morning, there was um, a series of vocalizations. And they were very, I have to admit, they were very avian sounding, this whistling sound. This <laughs> and uh, later, John, who is, was uh, at that time quite hard of hearing and uh, what, was not hearing the same, uh, hearing the sounds to the degree we were. He did hear them on a subsequent night, same sounds again, according to Todd. And he said, he's quite the avid birder. He said it, it had some resemblance to a solid owl, which is a little owl and often, you know, snuffles about in the under, in the duff, in the leaves and uh -huh. twigs and so forth. But what we heard was not, could not have been a little six inch owl. And there, there I've, I have experienced occasions when a small animal or bird rooting in the leaf litter can give the sound of something bigger. But this sounded like a bull moose, you know, <laughs> from the brush that it was breaking, stepping on branches and breaking things. And, and it had circled our camp. We were camped at the end of a road that was blocked off with a berm. And then beyond that berm, it dropped down into a creek bed. And then up the other side, the gravel road continued on in, but it was closed off. It was a, you know, a um, exploration road, a survey road. Uh -huh. And... Um, Whatever it was had circled around the camp, uh, and so it was in the tree line opposite us. And one of our group, Sonia, had gotten up, and she fancies herself something of an animal whisperer of sorts, not psychic or anything, but just has a, a connection, a knack with animals. Uh -huh. And she started walking right out into the darkness, away from the firelight, towards these sounds of brush popping and, and talking soothingly, reassuringly. And it was inter seemed to be interacting in the sense that she would say something and there would be a rustle of brush. And then she'd say something and a branch would crack. 
And then all of a sudden, it was like someone broke. It was like Matt Moneymaker breaking his Louisville slugger across the tree. <laughs> Iraq. And uh, I'm watching this through night vision, and I could see she just stopped, frozen, or shoot in her in her step, and there, and and I could see her her knee quivering, uh. and then she started to retreat, and she came and plopped down in a seat right next to me, and she just looked shaken, and it was more than just the sound, apparently. Yeah. And, uh, you know, whether it's just psychological or whether there was some kind of infrasound going on or who knows yeah. what, oh, it's more zapped as some like to call it. But at that point, the wind shifted slightly and the smoke blew in my face. I stood up and I st stepped around, which was good because it gave me a higher vantage point because I, I, I focused right down into that hollow of that creek bed. And uh, right at that instant, a shadowy figure broke from the that hollow and across you know on the other side of the berm actually it turns out it was up up on the opposite bank and it went right at an angle up to the trees on the opposite side of the road and as it crossed that gravelly road i could see the outline of it the silhouette of it from about look like about mid thigh up and honestly if you could imagine patty from the film the patterson gimlin film jet black in total silhouette that kind of proportion you know, and, and kind of the way when she walked behind all that debris, all that flood debris. And, so it seemed very uh, big to you. It did. It seemed quite, in fact, it was, you know, at first I thought it was right behind the berm, uh -huh. you know, but then when, and, and I had to, and, and well, let me, I, I sat there and I looked and I dropped my eye, you know, the, 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 the eyepiece from my eye and I, and I looked again and I kind of moved the, the thing back and forth to see if I could recreate the sensation of seeing a shadow, you know, because it's this dark shadow with the green background. Mm -hmm. and th there wasn't a whole lot of ambient light because the moon was very low and uh, and I did. We didn't have any IR, extra IR illumination going on. Um, and so a lot of speckly noise too. The, the noise ratio was a little high given the low ambient light. So I almost didn't say anything. And, uh, and then I thought, well, given the circumstances, you know, we should let's at least talk about it. And I wanted them to be sure to investigate to see if there were any footprints in that, you know, or circling around the camp or whatever. Uh -huh. And so I had to leave the next day before sunup to get to the airport for my flight. And so I wasn't privy to the investigation, but thankfully, um, Todd videotaped everything. He and John, you know, scoured that opposite slope and looked all through that creek bottom till they found what looked like some crushed vegetation of, of a heavy something heavy making its way and they flagged out the prints i talked to john independently separately you know privately afterward and he said well you know todd he said todd's a good tracker and he found these yeah. signs and he was quite excited about it he said you know i wasn't 100 percent sure but they all seemed to fall in the line and we he taped out that line and then Todd stood where I had been standing roughly and videotaped John walk that line. And you see it on the documentary when he plays that video for me the first time. Uh, it was just, you know, leading up to it as they're, as, as he's filming them looking for sign, I'm thinking you're too far. You're, you're way too far that way on the opposite bank. But then when he shot John walking the line, I realized that was it exactly. And that's why I thought it was so much closer because it, what I saw had to be at least a foot and a half uh -huh. taller than John. So it was so big that it made it seem like it was much closer, but it was actually clear on the opposite bank. So that, I mean, that's even more extraordinary, to be honest with you. That film, uh, that documentary of Todd's, actually, a, a friend, I, I don't know if I, I told you about this at the time when we, we spoke, a friend of my wife's, she was the head of SFX for um, oh. the Hobbit movies and Noah and, and a few movies like that. Yeah. And I actually got her to review his footage, his Sasquatch footage in the oh, movie. Yes. And, and the questions were very simple. She has no interest in this subject whatsoever. Right. I said, look, all I really want to know is, could this be faked? Could it be reproduced, you know, using your... your um, <laughs> using your palette so to speak right. yeah. um, model making and special effects and um, and if it could be faked what kind of quality would you say this work is and she said yes 
it's possible you could do work like this, but it's of a very high quality. And in fact, um, and she didn't mean this in a, in a derogatory way in any, in any way at all, but she said that the quality of the rest of the documentary, the way it's been shot, all, is not up to that same standard. Ah, interesting. So she said, I'm not saying the RNA, it could be done. Right. The heads are very still, which would allow you to do some 2D model making and animation, although there's some, is some high movement. She also noticed that um, uh, the one that's known as, uh, I think, is the, the, the juvenile, the, the dark head, Sasquatch, mm -hmm. would have to have makeup right down to, to beneath the eyelids if it was a person, which is a very painful experience to go through right. with latex and, and the like. So she didn't say yeah, you know, but it did change my perception of what yeah. was there and um again let's not go into that too much right. i'm sure we've spoke, <laughs> spoken about it hundreds of times but um i got the perception that you enjoyed working with todd and you thought that you know he was uh he's at least an accomplished outdoorsman who had a passion for this subject yeah uh, yeah i think that's a fair a fair assessment and i you know my attitude has remained uh you know, reserved judgment and let's let the chips fall where they may, yes. because I don't see the smoking gun. I mean, and I don't want to dismiss it because it, it doesn't look like I expect it to look, you know, uh, we kind of become, and I'm, and I'm certainly guilty of it. I know uh, we become uh, rather tunnel, uh, subject to tunnel vision based on our preconception. And for me, that preconception is the Patterson Gimlin film. Yes. So if it doesn't look like Patty's face, then there must be something up. And, and of course, all of his look different to one another, although right, they are in different areas. Right. It's interesting. I will drag you to that. I really, I promise. <laughs> and I promise I wouldn't. So no, I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to take you there. I mean, just just to to finish up, it's more of a, a, a comical question, really. You know, you're a scientist, a professional. You've been trained to to, to be objective, and evidence based. That's right. your career. Do you think that the investigation of Bigfoot has in itself some moorish element that can lead to obsession? Have you ever had to take yourself aside and say, can't be down a bit, Jeff, you're a man of science? Oh, well, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know that I've had to, to have that conversation with myself so much as I <laughs> I've had such conversations with others of my associates, you know. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, by, by amateur enthusiasts yes. uh, of yeah. various kinds and sometimes we you know disagree it, it it's always a delicate uh dance of detente because uh i i welcome and i encourage people to share their findings with me of course but, yeah. but if i'm you know but but for those amateur investigators their little piece of the of the puzzle is very personal. Uh -huh. So when, you know, scientists, most scientists learn and, and through experience are trained to be somewhat disinterested. I mean, you can't be disinterested, that's not the word. To not become possessive, I guess, or to own a hypothesis. Uh -huh. You know, the goal is to uh, nullify a hypothesis, to show an exception and uh -huh. then proceed to modify it and refine it and elaborate upon it. But uh, even the best of scientists can, uh, you know, have egos, have, um, have uh, a sense of accomplishment uh, or strive for that sense of accomplishment, I guess. And so it's kind of hard to knock down your work. And, and so there is a tendency to look for just that reaffirming evidence. Um, to bolster your ideas and yeah. so so anyway so that but 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 most scientists can take that kind of criticism they have to put their work up for peer review they have to put it out there to have holes punched in it yeah but the non-scientist that becomes a personal affront uh -huh. and so it's very difficult to, to be very critical one of the most challenging things that i find too is that someone will, will put forth a piece of evidence and if i'm a little bit negative or skeptical about it they come back and say, oh, well, well I have better pictures. I have better <laughs> footprint cast. And my response is, well, why in the world would you not lead out with your best evidence? There's this kind of holding something back, you know. Um, Saving it for the encore. Well, for the encore, yes. Or, or it's the ace up the sleeve yeah. in case 
their their uh, other evidence is negated. They still have this piece that, oh, they're absolutely sure this is better and this is it. And that's that's a, a real minefield to navigate through. Yeah, like because it, it, it encompasses mm -hmm. belief. Right. Um, I described this recently, this mm -hmm. area of cryptozoology, but cryptozoology as, as a whole, as a, um, a multi-denominational faith, yeah. belief system, in fact, uh, in which you have all of these um, opposing opinions without or without any definitive evidence to back them right. up. Yep. And essentially, if you don't believe what I believe, then you must be part of the other church. Right. Church of the Wu, Church of the <laughs> Gigantopithecus Church. I'm in the Gigantopithecus Church. Right. Primarily. But now, obviously, after our chats and reading a lot of your material, now I've got to consider the Almas and all those guys too. So things modify. And um, religions generally don't. And I think it would be nice for a lot more of us in future to, to pick up some of these things. I have some of the brochures, as you say, with the guides on, on casting and, and collecting hair samples and all that, those things. I do suggest that people get them because they've really helped me. Sure. I don't think I found anything to cast or to, <laughs> to set aside at the moment, but it, you know, it, it's part of the joy of it. Jeff, just before we go, is there anything coming up, any way that people can support you? What's the best way to find you, any works, new books and things like that? Right. Well, uh, I mean, the books that you've mentioned, my 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 book, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, and the the field guides that were published by Paradise K, are, are either available through Amazon or through Paradise K. Even Sasquatch Legend Meets Science is also carried by their um, uh, distribution, their retail section as well. Um, of late, I I've kind of wanted to push the Relic Hominoid Inquiry. It is a scholarly journal. It's it's a journal. It's not just a web page. And some people get misconception, having misconception of its role and purpose. But it's intent. It's a registered scholarly journal with peer-reviewed papers. Uh, it has research papers. It has editorials. It has commentary. Lots of book reviews. The book reviews are very useful because you know if you want another uh, in, want insight or a, another opinion about um, a particular title that has come out. And, and, and the book reviews are mostly uh, those that are written by scholarly authors. Uh, yeah. But, but, it, it's, but I, I'm stressing the point that it's very useful to the non-academic audience as well. Uh -huh. uh, you might have to pull out your dictionary or thesaurus, but, but that's sure. fine. It's a good exercise. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, they're online now. Jeff, yeah, there's no right. excuse for not pulling them out. That's right. It's very easy. <laughs> right click. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, and that's found that that's uh, still we're in our seventh year, seven volumes, wow. annual volumes now. Each volume is a total of about 130 to 170 pages. That's great. Uh, they're richly illustrated, color illustrations, the, the articles. So we don't have that constraint that many publishers have uh -huh. uh, uh, on, you know, paper publishers. And it's hosted by the university webpage uh, or um, a server rather, rather web server. So it's it's um, isu.edu forward slash rhi. Very simple to find. And uh, and I'd encourage people to, to avail themselves of that. It's a more reliable source of information in many ways than would be just, uh, you know, the constant barrage that you're encountering on online from all yeah. the Facebook pages and web pages. So um, yeah. maybe it'll, I hope it'll serve as a little bit of an anchor uh, about, uh, you know, what good what constitutes good solid research. I think that would be very, very useful to everybody else. I myself, you know, I'm, I'm still out there looking for those red circles. Yes, yeah. the words. <laughs> but, you know, until I find one, I don't believe that they're real. Um, Jeff, Thank you so much for coming on. You've been a great guest and it's always good to talk to you and I look forward to catching up in the near future. Well, very good. I will as well. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. <laughs>